Thank you, Kelly. I appreciate it. Um, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Human Powered and Society Embracing session of Transcending the Crisis Virtual Conference. Um, I am Denise DiPiano. Uh, I'm an HR leader and uh, catalyst that values today's topics um, and integrates them in HR practices that respect human dignity um, and achieve business outcomes. I'm very excited um, about today's conversation as we explore learn and share from each other's experiences, wisdom, and perspectives. Um, I am honored and thrilled to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Paige Williams. Um, Paige is a speaker, mentor, and the author of her upcoming book, Becoming Anti-Fragile, Learning to Thrive Through Disruption, Challenge, and Change. So welcome, Paige, especially um, I know that it's in the wee hours of the morning for you. So thank you so much for um, participating. Um, please tell us a little bit about um, yourself and, and what you do. Sure. Thank, thank you, Denise. It's great to be here. Um, yeah, so um, I am a, I'm someone who's been in business, was in business for over 20 years. I've been a senior leader in business uh, in the UK and Europe. Um, and in the last 10 years or so, um, I've moved into academia. I've done a PhD research looking at how we create systems of well-being and thriving in organizations. Um, and I still continue to research and lecture from the Center of Positive Psychology at the University of Melbourne. And alongside that now, I have my private practice. Um, and in the last probably six to 12 months or so, my work in my private practice has really focused on this idea of anti-fragile leadership. So what does it mean for us to become anti-fragile um, as individuals? Um, and then extending that out, that's the, the current book. Um, what does it mean for us to create anti-fragile teams and create anti-fragile systems um, through a leadership lens? Great. Well, to that to that point, then it kind of segues nicely into what what does it mean to become um, anti fragile, and what tools um, can we use to achieve an anti fragile mindset? Sure. Well, certainly the way that I frame up becoming anti fragile is that from an individual perspective, and that's where where I think we'll start the conversation, is that it's an interaction between the level of disruption in your environment. So the level of uncertainty, challenge and change on the one hand, and then your capacity to thrive through that or an individual's capacity. So, and by that, I mean, what's their perception of their um, motivation, of their ability, of the support that they have to deal with the level of disruption that they have going on in their environment. And so whether we feel fragile or robust or anti-fragile really depends on whether there is a gap between that level of disruption in our environment. Our capacity to thrive through that level of disruption. So if we, we feel confident and we feel motivated and we feel we've got support to deal with the level of disruption, then, then that's when we start to actually feel more anti-fragile. Whereas if we feel that there's a big gap between our motivation, support and resources available um, compared to what's being asked of us in terms of the disruption in our context, then that's when we can feel very fragile. So, so you had mentioned um, and talked about the systems of well-being, and to me, when I'm listening to you about um, having more of that that anti-fragile mindset, um, what resonated with me is kind of not safe in a place of comfortable, but safe a, 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 an ecosystem of safety from a more exploratory, and that it's okay to explore. Can you talk a little bit maybe about that that from your perspective about that ecosystem and about those those healthy systems and what that means? Yeah, sure. So I, I think it's, I think that one of the things that we need to realize is I, I talked then about it being an interaction between the level of disruption and our capacity to thrive through that level of disruption. So one of the things about systems and, you know, whether you're talking about a system of one or a team as a system or a whole organization or some of the larger systems that we're talking about, um, both in this track in terms of society, but in some of the other tracks as well, is that there's this dynamism that happens 
um, within a system. And so it's not something that's static and stable. It's not something that you can set and forget. And I think this is one of the things that's critical in terms of us becoming anti-fragile. And you'll notice that the title of the book is Becoming, you know, which in itself means that there's, there's a, um, an interactive nature to it, that there's an evolving nature to it, that it's about movement and dynamism. And I think that that's one of the things that's inherent in any system is that we have dynamics. Um, and I think that that's one of the important things that we understand as we become anti-fragile or that around our understanding of anti-fragility is that it's not something that we can do and that we tick off. And um, certainly in, in the book, I talk about it being a journey uh, that we're on and that maybe we never get to the end of that, um, but maybe we can start integrating it into who we are so that we move from becoming to being. Um, and so rather than it being that sits out something that sits outside us or something that sits in our actions, it actually becomes part of who we are. It becomes ingrained in the system, as it were, a defining factor or a defining element of the system and the way the system operates. So I think that there are particular aspects of the way that we think about anti-fragile that, uh, you know, are deeply embedded in systems thinking, uh, whether that's a system of one as us or whether we're thinking explicitly in terms of collective systems whether that be teams organizations or larger human systems what, what, what from your perspective what is a misconception of anti-fragility so I, I i think that there's a lot of um people often uh, use use the term of kind of resilience um, as anti-fragility and I think that there are definitely some similarities so it and that can be a great start point for people to kind of be in the right playing field around what, what, what are we talking about here so if we want to give people a flavor of what we're talking about I think resilience can be the start of the conversation um, but but I believe that that's exactly what it is it's the start of the conversation and one of the questions I often get is well how is it different Paige you know mm -hmm. how is anti-fragility really any different to resilience um, and the thing that I that I focus on or the thing the way that I explain it is that Often resilience is, is about bouncing back. That's one of the, the metaphors that are, that are used. It, you, you like a tennis ball. Um, and and I use a, we use the term robust as well in kind of anti-fragile language where we're able to withstand whatever's going on. Um, but it means, again, whilst there might be some impact, we're able to come back to where we were. It's really one of the things that I think that separates, that distinguishes anti-fragility from resilience is that it's about actually improving and getting better, um, which is why and, you know, I, I have specifically used the word learning around the title of the book, because I think that that is one of the things that separates anti-fragility from robustness. And I use this term, we learn forward. We learn forward from our experiences which as you've already highlighted, Denise, are not necessarily comfortable. It's not that this is an easy journey for us to go on. Thriving and struggle often go hand in hand. And I've been involved in, in many research um, projects that have shown that actually when we thrive and as human systems, we don't necessarily do our best work when we're in kind of our comfort zone. And I'm sure I'm sure you've seen it. I know I have. I'm sure our, our listeners have today where actually, do you know what? Sometimes it's when we have to dig deep. Sometimes it's when we're really challenged that we do our best work um, and that we feel a sense of meaning and that we... Yes, purpose. Yes. Yeah, meaning yeah. and purpose. And because of that, we pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and, and somehow we, we achieve performance that we didn't necessarily know we were even capable of. And what we get through that is a sense of accomplishment, meaning and purpose. We get a sense of um, outcomes that we didn't know were possible. And, you know, that's what leads us to this sense of thriving. So yeah. I, think that, I think an important aspect of anti-fragility is one, understanding that it's about learning forward. It, it's not about just coming back to where we were, this idea of improving and getting better through the disruption challenge and change. And then the second thing is that, hey, but that's not necessarily a comfortable process. So this idea that thriving and struggle go hand in hand. Great. I, I, I absolutely, um, you know, I, I think that's uh, such an important uh, point about um, you know, that, that, that going forward and taking those experiences, both 
uh, good and bad, which is what we learn from, right? The, 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 the failures as well are just as important, if not maybe more important than those successes um, and really being able to, you know, take that as a springboard and continue your journey of, of learning and, and um, exploration and successes and failures. Um, so I love that. Thank you. Um, I know that you had talked about when we, you first introduced yourself um, about leadership, and I know that um, that's a, a real passion for of, of yours. Um, in the book, you talk about um, leadering rather than leadership. Um, can you explain what the difference is? Um, what what's the distinction? Okay, so. So I think I, I'm, I'm going to just take us a step back and because sure. and, and, I'd like to contextualize why am I passionate about leadering, leadership, whatever that L word is that we want to use. Um, and certainly it comes back to systems. OK, so in my PhD research, as I was looking at how do we create thriving systems in organizations, um, what I looked at was when we look to create change, often in organizations, we want to train change into people. Um, and, and yet actually that's not enough. So often what we look to do is create the change within someone kind of from the inside out and then expect kind of the magic to happen. Um, and what we don't often address is, is the context. Okay. So this idea of what's happening on the outside. So we might, we might train someone, we might give them new skills, new ideas, but then actually when we send them back into their team or their organization, actually the context takes over. So this idea of culture, um, you know, eating any internal, not just eating strategy, but eating any internal change that we might be able to make with people in terms of their mindsets and attitudes and their behaviors. So we've got these two dynamics going on. We've got inside out in terms of creating change around people's attitudes, mindsets, behaviors. And we've got outside in, which is what's going on in terms of the processes and practices and culture of an organization. And the reason that I am so focused and passionate about leadership is that leadership bridges those outside in and inside out factors. So if we can create change with leaders in, an organi in a formal sense in an organization, leaders shape that kind of outside in experience for the people in their teams. So if we start, that's why I'm focusing on leadership or leaders. Um, in the first place, because that way we get to actually affect change most effectively in a system. So then if we come to, so why not leadership? Why leadering? I really believe, and I think this is one of the, one of the things that I love about anti-fragile is it, it challenges traditional ways of thinking. And I think our traditional ideas and models of leadership are broken. And I think they have been for a while. I, I think they were designed for a time that we've moved on from um, and that there are complexities and dynamics going on in our society and our organizations now that this traditional thinking around leadership just isn't working anymore. And I also think that leadership, when we think about it, certainly in terms of organizations and when we're taught about it, um, we tend to think of it in terms of formal leadership and we tend to give this this kind of responsibility or this opportunity for leadership to people who are in leadership roles and and i just don't believe that that's the case i believe that we all each of us has leadership capacity and and it really becoming anti-fragile is actually about some about some of it is about leaning in to the inherent leadering capacity that we all have. And leadering is about how we show up every day. Um, it's intentional, it's action oriented, it's not a noun, it's a verb. Um, and it's about being a leader of yourself first and foremost, um, and actually taking responsibility for that and, and then thinking about what impact does that then have on others? Whether you are in this formal leadership role or not. And, and I think that if we move our mindsets around um, leadering, little l leadering, then we start to shift our expectations around how we ask people to show up and what is okay and not okay. And where we go to for collective wisdom in any system, whether that's around the family dinner table, whether it's around the team meeting table, whether it's around the board, board table, that actually we acknowledge that everyone has leadering contribution to make, 
Um, and we honor that and we invite it to be part of the conversation. And I think one, that that's certainly one of the things that I bring up as being a critical capacity to increase anti-fragility in any system. So really it's about how do we access all of the wonderful leadering capacity that we have available in any system, whether that's a system of one, a family system of four, six, eight, a team, or you know, as we scale up from there. Have you seen a, a change in that during the crisis? Um, and what I mean by that is that from, from my experience that um, people who, who have not been, again, in that traditional leadership role, right? They don't have uh, a manager title or, and I, I don't like titles, but that's a whole other story. Um, yeah. But in that, <laughs> we, we don't have enough time. Um, but that, that they've stepped into it, that, that leaders have um, emerged and people that are in traditional quote unquote leadership roles have really not stepped into it and that, that there's um, definitely, um, uh, you can see a, a large gap in, in that. Have, have you worked with your clients regarding that? Have you seen it with your clients or your own personal life? So, so I think what's happened, what the crisis has, has really laid bare is the fragility of this traditional thinking around leadership. And what it's blown out of the water are some of the structures that have kept us locked into that traditional leadership, uh, traditional thinking around leadership. So, one, you know, once you um, kind of take away some of the structure and process that, um, that the uh, leadership, uh, power is too strong a word, but, but that leadership resides in, in, in its traditional sense. So things like um, having kind of um, um, people at, kind of in uh, formal workplaces. So once you do dissolve that and devolve that, then it starts being much more about what's the little L leadering that people are prepared to do. Um, and I think that certainly for, for people, for leaders who have... Um, held on tight to the, um, to the symbols of their leadership and the structures rather than actually their own leadering capacity. They're the leaders that have really felt um, that they've had the rug pulled out from under them with the, the COVID situation because how they were, the, how they were um, showing up in their leadership was more about um, whether it was the structures or processes or the particular dynamics that the workplace afforded them that actually once you move people out of that um, out of that situation, those those dynamics and what they had to hold on to in terms of holding on to their leadership power disappeared. And so that it kind of leveled the playing field. And this little L leadership it really came to the fore in terms of what was the opportunity now. And, and you're right, Denise, I've seen it with my clients, I've seen it in my in my own life around people have either lent into this and, and been able to demonstrate anti-fragility in many ways in terms of their response to the uncertainty and, and the lack of control. And I, and, I, and I think this is one thing I really was hoping we would get to in our conversation is I think one of the critical things that a leader, uh, an anti-fragile leadership mindset is about is letting go of this idea that we that we can control, letting go of the idea that actually um, we can, you know, that 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 this level of uncertainty that we have, we're able to somehow tame that, um, and that leadership is about being able to control and then plan and strategize, and look. I recognize there has to be some semblance of that in organizations in order for teams and organizations to function well. Um, but the, the degree to which we've tried to control our environment and lead from that standpoint it is just, it, it's, it's a fallacy. It, it's not the way that effective leadering works in natural dynamic human systems. Um, I'm not sure if I answered your question. No, you, you did. It, the, the, <laughs> the other, the, you, you did. It's not, it's not a question, a Q and a session. It's a conversation. Um, yeah. The other thing that, that kind of struck me too, when you were talking is, is that that whole notion of ego and, um, and, and fear of a leader of that. If I have a, a team, even if, I, if I'm on a team and I'm not necessarily the manager or those people report to me, but that fear of 
allowing other people to express something that potentially is either different than mine, and I don't know how to uh, really digest that, or um, I don't, I don't want to say the word better, but maybe, uh, but maybe it is, and maybe it's a, 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 it's a, or just a different perspective. And I don't know how to digest that. And I think, can, do you see that? Do you have, uh, can you talk about that? I, I just think that's. Sure. So I, I firmly, I've um, absolutely believe that fragile, uh, that ego is one of the things that makes us fragile, right? And so if we can let go of ego, immediately we're going to become more anti-fragile as much as anything else because we're not going to be holding on too tight to we, we've got to look like this and, and we've got to have the best idea and we've got to have the, the most dominant voice, right? So if we let go of ego and we show up in a situation in service of what the best outcome is for that situation, that's going to make us more anti-fragile without a doubt, in my opinion. So I, I, and as we let go of ego, um, then we start to, one of the, uh, so for the book, I developed a, um, six principles, guiding principles that we can use on the becoming anti-fragile journey. Um, and I kind of um, have put them together so they spell the word robust. And the S of the robust is seek collective wisdom, right? And part of our, our, part of our perspective, our mindset in seeking, collecting, seeking collective wisdom is this idea that actually if we are there with our ego and in service of the best outcome for whatever's going on in our environment, then we actually want different perspectives. In fact, we invite constructive argument. And it's not, and, and what we do is we put the, the, the ideas at the center of the conversation rather than ego. So if you and I disagree, Denise, we can disagree. It doesn't mean that I dislike you. It just means we have different perspectives on what's going on here. Yeah. Um, and it's about separating my perspective on something from whether you like me or not. Right? And, and, and that's, uh, that means letting go of ego. And that means having quite a mature way, yeah. a grown up way of showing up. Um, and some, of, some leaders or some of us are more able to do that than others. But this idea of inviting argument, inviting constructive argument. And I think one of the things that it's, that natural leadering does is it facilitates those kinds of containers space for people to have different points of view in a respectful way and to walk out of that conversation with relationships still intact. Yeah, I think that's so important and to separate the, the person from the idea, you know, in, in human resources, there would be times when obviously I had to let someone go and it's not that I just like that person or it wasn't about the person, it was about their performance or something that they did, their behaviors. Um, and I used to try to explain that to even the managers that it's not about the person, it's about what that person did or didn't do. Um, so I think that's really critical. So um, let me just check on time real fast. Um, I know we're at 12.23. So let me see if there's any questions. Um, let's see, let me move this box over here. Actually, Dana has a question. Um, Great perspective on leader in what is the distinction between inside out and outside in. So inside out is to create change in behavior. How about outside in? How does that impact culture in organizations? Thanks, so, Dana. Yeah, lovely, lovely question, Dana. Thank you. So inside out are literally the things that can't be separated from me. So my mindsets, my attitudes, my behaviors, you know, they're all with me. But outside in are things that affect my experience and, and my research was in the workplace, so expect my experience in the workplace, but they're separate from me. So one of them is my leader, okay? So it's my supervisor or my manager. Um, so it's the leader, it's the resources that I have available to me, whether that's social resources or physical resources or learning resources, it's the culture of the wider organization. Um, so they're, they're separate from me, but they very much influence my experience at work. And because I was particularly looking at how do we enable thriving in workplaces, they, they therefore impact my capacity to thrive at work. 
So that's the very simple distinction is inside out, things that you can't separate from me or from you as an individual, outside in, things in the context that impact my experience in that context. And, and so often organizational change or change looks at a process, but doesn't look at the locus of where, where do we want the change to occur? Is it an inside out? or an outside in where we want the change to occur. And what my research found, which makes sense in terms of systems, is that actually you want those two things to interact. So when we want to effect, if, uh, when we want to create effective change, we need to do inside out and outside in and think about how they're gonna leverage off each other so we create upward spirals of, of whatever particular flavor of change we want to create. Great, Great question, That's thank fabulous. you, Dana. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me see if there's any other questions for you, Paige. Just one moment. Um, no, I think that's it at the moment. Perfect. So we're just about five minutes to go. Um, so let me just ask you, um, as we come to the, to the, the, the close, um, can you name uh, one thing starting from today, tomorrow, um, that people can action um, as a first step towards embracing anti-fragility um, in their personal as well as their professional um, lives? So I think that one of the conversations that um, the COVID situation has brought to the surface, and I, um, I wrote about this recently, about how do we, and I think this is a theme that we're seeing played out around the globe at the moment, how is it that we bring things out of the shadow out of the shadows and into the light so that we can more clearly see what they are. We can have the right conversations around the right stuff and from that take the right action moving forward. And so one of those things that I think needs to come out of the shadows and into, into the light is this, this normalizing of, of struggle as part of the human experience. And I think that we need to do that in organizations. We need to do that with ourselves and be okay with I'm struggling right now and, and I'm okay with that. It doesn't mean I need to shut anything down. And, and how is it we can engage a conversation around struggle with curiosity? How is it we can bring it into the light without kind of wanting to expose anyone in any way or make people feel uncomfortable, but just with this gentle curiosity around what, what, is, what is the thing I'm struggling with now and, and how is it that I can engage it with, through a learning and curious mindset and understand that actually there may be an opportunity for me to thrive at the other side of this. Um, and one of the things that I talk about in the book is we have this idea of, of um, in the social sciences, something called post-traumatic growth. Um, and I think that anti-fragility is is, is micro, one of the aspects is micro post-traumatic growth. It's not that we've been through a life-changing trauma that, that means that kind of everything has been shaken uh, from a very uh, fundamental basis for us in terms of beliefs or, or kind of um, where we're at in life. But if we can take a micro post-traumatic growth approach, then how is it that we can actually go, okay, how can I test and learn through this? I'm struggling with something. How can I bring that from the shadows to the light? Have a look at it, okay, in quite a strategic kind of dispassionate way and find the learning opportunity. Where's the, where's the growth that I get through this struggle? Um, and I think that if we can create, if we can normalize that kind of mindset for ourselves and if we can create safe conversations for people to talk about their experiences with that as well, I think that would be a fundamental shift in, in the way that we see people leadering um, every day and, and particularly in, in organizations, teams and workplaces. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I don't, I don't know about you, but I don't know any person, whether in my personal or professional life, that doesn't have a struggle in some way, right? I mean, we all have struggles. Um, Part of the human experience. It's ab right? Absolutely. It's, it's about being... It. Yeah, I mean, and, and it's like some people feel like it's something to be fixed, like you have to fix it. And there's yeah. not, there, you, you can't fix it. You have to learn how to lean into it and, and learn from it and, and grow from it. Um, so, yes, yeah, so thank you very much. Um, I love your, your perspective so much. 
So I think we're, let me see if there's one other question that came through. No, it's the same one. Okay, perfect. Okay. Okay, great. Um, anything else that you would um, like to share with us, share with the audience that we didn't get to? I think we have like one minute left or maybe not. I think it's 1230. Um, no, thank you so much for the opportunity. All I'd say is please buy my book. It's my yes, first book. Abso absolutely. <laughs> it was, a... about it. and so there's so much more in, in the book, um, around this and, uh, and yeah, I just look forward to uh, keeping the conversation going. I, I read some of the, um, the excerpts that, that you had sent me and I will tell you that it's a very, um, relatable book. It is not one that's so in theories and, and academic that you can't really relate to it. It is really very well written and I'm sure you put a lot of thought into it. So it really was a, a wonderful reading it. Thank you so much for sharing it with me. Oh, thank you, Denise. That's really kind of you. Generous thank of you. Me. Thank you so much, Paige. I appreciate it. And hopefully you can uh, <laughs> get some rest. <laughs> I know it's like 2.30 in the morning for you. So, sure is, yeah. <laughs> so thank you.